For the second part of this talk, I'd like to show you some really neat birds that, we, that I was able to see on two different trips to Botswana. Botswana is in the southern part of Africa, above South Africa, and then to the east of Namibia. And a small strip of Namibia uh, goes over a portion of the northern part of Botswana. I stayed in two, three, three areas in Botswana, the Akabango Delta, the Linyati River, which is a wetland area, and the Makadagadi salt pan area. The Magadagadi salt pan area is the only non-wetland place that I stayed. And this is a Google Earth map showing you the specific locations of the camps that I stayed in. Uh, stayed in three camps along the Akavango Delta, two different camps along the wetlands of the Linyanti River, and then the northern end of the Makadagadi uh, salt pan. Again, the only non-wetland area. And this is a picture as I'm flying over the Akavango Delta to, to get to one of the camps. Uh, it's absolutely spectacular. Um, it's a very pristine area. It's a vast area of undisturbed wetlands and seasonally flooded grasslands. It's home to some of the world's most endangered mammals and 22 species of globally threatened birds. And one of the larger birds that we saw was the Cory Bustard. Uh, the Cory Bustard is the national bird of Botswana, and it's the world's largest flying bird. Um, it's the largest one known, came in at 49 pounds. And then also in the Bustard family, uh, saw the northern black Coran, which is endemic to southern Africa, and the red-crested Coran. Yeah. And all three of these birds are, 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 are pretty large birds, pretty heavy birds. And then, of course, the world's largest bird, uh, the ostrich, which is a flightless bird, uh, you're likely to uh, see these on, on any trip you go to either East Africa or the southern end of Africa. And we saw two species of, of spurfowl. Spurfowl are in the pheasant family. And same thing, uh, same family that chickens and turkeys are in. And they're, uh, one of the characteristics of the family is the male has a tarsal spur that he uses in intraspecific fighting. And so this is the red-billed spurfowl, also used, used to be called the red-billed francolin. And this is Swainson spurfowl. But again, notice that tarsal spur in this male. And then in a different family, but also a uh, also classified as a game bird, uh, the helmeted guinea fowl, and the helmet the helmeted guinea fowl are in a are in a family that is endemic to Africa, and these are are quite beautiful birds. We also saw several species of of ducks. This is a knob-billed duck, uh, named because the male has a large knob on his bill during the breeding season. And then white-faced whistling ducks. It's, it was fun to see them. Uh, in fact, this is the first time I, I saw a species of, of whistling duck. Uh, let me go ahead and play the call for you, and you can see why they're called whistling ducks. And then a, uh, we also saw the spur-winged goose, which is common in the delta. And in fact, the delta is a stronghold for this species. It's a very large goose. It is also classified as a game bird, and it can be hunted from April to October, like the guinea fowl and then the, uh, the spur fowl. We saw several species of storks between the, between the two trips. This is a yellow-billed stork. Notice a very long yellow bill. Notice that the bill is curved at the end and the tip is, is pretty narrow. Uh, the bird has a very sensitive bill and that helps it uh, 
which enables it to hunt in, in muddy or murky water. But because the, the tip is so narrow, it limits it to pretty small prey. My favorite stork is a, is a saddle-billed stork, and it's an African endemic. Um, it has very long legs, so it can see over the grasses. Uh, it ha and the long legs and long bill allow it to get uh, large fish from deeper water. And it's, it, it is, the, this bird lacks a syrinx, so it's a, it cannot make sounds with the with uh, organ, it lacks the organ that birds use to make sounds. Uh, but it can, it does do a bill clacking sound by clacking its bills together. And probably the, the least attractive stork that I saw was uh, the marabou stork. The marabou stork has black legs, but notice how they ap appear white here. And these whitewashed legs are because storks will urinate on their legs to cool themselves. And this is a, a neat bird I, I felt lucky to see. It's an African open bill, which is a flood, floodplain specialist. And the bill uh, enables this bird to easily extract snails and mussels from their shells. Saw, saw only one species of crane in Botswana, the, the wattled crane. Um, the single largest concentration of this, this crane species occurs in the Okavango Delta. Uh, in common with other cranes, it's monogamous. Uh, it has an elaborate courtship display, and it congregates in flocks during the non-breeding season. We saw the hammer cop a, a number of times. In this particular uh, image, it, it's gathering nest material. I wish I had had a chance to see and photograph a nest. They make a, a huge nest. It takes them about six weeks to, to build the nest, but I did not get to get the opportunity to see an actual hammercock nest. The only ibis I was able to get a, a decent photograph of is a sacred ibis, and it got its name because it was worshipped as a god in ancient Egypt. And in fact, uh, Sacred ibises were often, uh, the sacred ibis was often mummified and, and buried with the pharaohs. In the same family as the, uh, as the sacred ibis, uh, the African spoonbill. And this, like other spoonbills, feeds by sweeping its bill from side to side in the water uh, to catch fish, frogs, and other invertebrates. We also saw a few heron species. This is uh, the Goliath heron, which is the world's largest heron. It's unique uh, due to its size and its dependence on large fish. And it has very long legs to give it access to deep water where the large fish are. A much smaller heron, the black heron, is doing a type of feeding called canopy feeding. Okay. And in fact, our, our guides called this bird the umbrella bird. But it's kind of a neat feeding strategy. They open their wings up and make kind of an umbrella type, uh, make an umbrella with their wings, and that creates shade that attracts fish. It's also believed that the shade allows the bird to see the fish in the water more easily. This heron is called a squacko heron, and it gets its name from its alarm or flight call. And so let me play that uh, call for you. So the squawking call of the squacko heron. And this is uh, uh, another one of one of my favorite birds. Uh, this is a secretary bird. I, I love where it gets a name. It, it got its name from male secretaries in the late 1800s that often wore gray tailcoats and knee-length pants, and then would have a goose quill pin behind their ear. Uh, ear. Uh, it's also referred to as Africans marching eagle in reference to the fact that they will cover between 12 and 18 miles a day walking slowly and searching for prey. A 
I saw four different species of vultures in Botswana. And vultures in Africa are, are really facing problems. Their, their populations are, are plummeting. Uh, notice that the lappet faced vulture uh, on the le top left is endangered, and then the other three species of vultures that I have on this slide are critically endangered. And that is in part due to the fact that in 2013, poachers started poisoning carcasses. And by poisoning the carcasses, circling vultures would not alert anti-poaching units to their location. And, and so poisoning carcasses by poachers and also by, uh, by, by farmers is a, is a huge problem. But I want to mention a, some, a little something about the, the vulture feeding hierarchy. Uh, the lappet face vulture is a huge vulture, and it's the first one that can get to the carcass, and basically the only species that, can, that is strong enough with a big enough beak and is strong enough to tear open that carcass. And then the white-backed vulture and the white-headed vulture uh, can move in and start pulling meat out of the carcass. And the hooded, uh, the hooded vulture is referred to as a pecker, where it kind of pecks at the meat that's left over on the bones of the carcass. So here's a, a bigger picture of the lappet face vulture, which is a nice looking bird as, as far as vultures go. And uh, a larger picture of the white back vulture, the hooded vulture, and the white headed vulture. And these were all at a at a carcass that we came upon when we were we when we were driving around on our on our game drive. We also saw a number of raptors, um, and this beautiful bird is called is the Marshall eagle, which is Africa's largest eagle, and it's big enough to prey on fairly uh, big enough to prey on fairly large uh, large animals, and that includes the hyrax small antelopes, and even impala calves. And will also prey on small predators, such as serval cats and jag uh, jackals. Uh, this is the tawny eagle, which is a common and widespread bird of prey. Uh, we saw these a number of times in, in Botswana. And the African Fish eagle can be seen on, uh, it uses trees along rivers uh, to, to hunt from and nest in. And so, uh, and so you can often see these uh, perched in the canopy on the trees along the woodlands. This is a battler. We saw a number of these, and the name comes from the fact that the term battler is, uh, is French for tightwalk tightrope walker. And when these guys are have their wings out and they're gliding, they kind of tilt from side to side, just like a tightrope walker. And that's in part due to the fact that they have a very short tail. And this is a, a beautiful hawk called a pale chanting uh, goshawk. And it has a hunting association with several animals, including the, the honey badger and the blackback jackal. It will follow them in order to catch prey items that they flush. This is a fully developed an adult, and this is a, a juvenile pale chanting goshawk. And then in the falcon family, uh, we saw the greater kestrel, which is easily identified from its white eye. And then in the Thickney stone curlew family, we saw the water Thickney, notice the large eyes because it tends to be active at dawn and dusk and at night. And this beautiful black wing stilt, very similar uh, in appearance to our black neck stilt that we can see down in Bolsa Chica certain times of year. And we saw a number of species of, of lapwings, and, and I, I think one species of plover. Um, lapwings and plovers are in the same family. Uh, they have large eyes because they sort of do a, 
a run, stop, and look hunting strategy. This is the long-toed lapwing. This is the crowned lapwing. This is a blacksmith lapwing. And this is the African wattle lapwing. Okay. So lots of species of lapwings. And then one plover, the, the three-banded plover, that looks somewhat similar to a killdeer. I saw two species of coursers, the Timonix courser. and the double banded courser okay and they are insector insector insectivorous birds so one species of sand grouse uh both the male and female double banded sand grouse uh, apparently there are only one of two families worldwide where the dia is exclusively seeds from the time of hatching for the rest of their lives so there is the male, and there is the female, double-banded sand grouse. I was only get, able to get pictures of one species of owl, and that is rose eagle owl, which is Africa's largest owl. Uh, it's a big owl, and it can feed on, a, on a pretty big prey. It feeds on prey from insects to game birds to, to small mammals. Notice the pink eyelids on this guy. And this image was taken very, very early in the morning. And so it was much darker than uh, when I was taking this picture than the picture actually looks. Saw so, uh, uh, one species of roller and they were very uh, common. Uh, the, the guides would refer to them as another bloody roller. But anyway, this lilac breasted roller, uh, a very beautiful bird. Um, uh, and the rollers are named from their long rolling dives during uh, courtship. We also saw a number of species of kingfishers. And kingfishers in Africa are way easier to photograph than uh, kingfishers around here. I still do not have a decent picture of our local belted kingfisher. This is a woodland kingfisher, which is one, spe one of two species that actually nest in cavities in trees. Uh, the rest nest in tunnels in the ground. Uh, this is a striped kingfisher. And the pied kingfisher, we saw a number of pied kingfishers. And it's one of the few species of kingfishers that can hover. It does not rely on a perch, and that means it can hunt wherever fish are plentiful. And we took a, a evening boat cruise in, in uh, one of the wetland areas specifically to look for malachite kingfishers. It's a very small kingfisher and a very beautiful kingfisher. And I was able to uh, photograph a number of them on this river cruise. They hunt in reeds along the rivers. We also saw five species of bee eaters. The most common one was the southern carmen bee eater. If you recall, when I talked about the Cory Bustard, the national bird of Botswana, uh, the world's largest fl uh, flying bird, well, the Southern Carmine Bee Eater and the Cory Bustard have sort of an interesting association. The Bee Eater, this is not my image, I wish I could have seen this, but the Bee Eater uses the Bustard as a mobile perch and will feed on insects that the bustard flushes when it's hunting for small rodents and lizards. And apparently the, the bee eater will alert the bustard to predators. And so it's sort of a mutualistic relationship. Some other bee eaters that, uh, that I saw, the swallowtail bee eaters. And by the way, bee eaters do eat bees, but they eat other insects also. The blue-cheeked bee-eater, and notice those blue cheeks. And then the very beautiful white-fronted bee-eater. And then a very, uh, and then the smallest one I saw, uh, appropriately named the little bee-eater. 
Saw the African hoopoe uh, several times. Noticed the recurved bill that it used to uses to probe and bark for insects and, and insect larvae. We also saw a number of species of hornbills. Hornbills are unique in that they're top two neck vertebrae are fused to help support the large bill. They're monogamous and they're cavity nesters. And so when the female, when the female's ready to lay her eggs, she will enter the cavity and then fill that, uh, fill the opening to that cavity with a mixture of mud and feces, leaving open only a narrow slit through which the male can feed her. And she will stay in there and be fed and attended to by the male uh, about 50 days in order to, to brood, the, brood the eggs and care for the chicks. And this is not my picture. This is one that I got from the web, but it's showing you a, uh, a southern yellow-billed hornbill peering through the slit uh, in, the, in that cavity. This is a southern red-billed hornbill. Saw a lot of these. And this is a picture of a female practicing nest, uh, squirting her drop out, droppings out of that slit uh, for nest sanitation. Uh, this is a gray hornbill. And then this is the largest species of hornbill. This is a southern ground hornbill. It is an, a different family than the other species of hornbills. It's this, the southern, the ground hornbill family is in, endemic to Africa. And ground hornbills differ from other hornbills in the number of neck vertebrae, in the fact that they don't seal their nest entrance, and they don't practice any form of nest sanitation. But it, uh, they're they're a beautiful bird, and uh, I saw them on a on a couple on both trips to Botswana. Also saw two species of shrikes. Uh, this is a magpie shrike, and this is a lesser gray shrike. And shrikes are known for their hooked bills, and they're sometimes referred to as butcher birds because they will use that hooked bill to dismember prey. Uh, and sometimes they will impale their prey on thorns. We did not see that on, on this trip. And this is a bird that I only saw on the last trip to Botswana. It's a very cool bird, or at least it has a very cool call. And it's called the gray go away bird. And let me play that call for you. And to me, that call really does sound like the bird is saying, go away, go away. So uh, it, was, it was really neat to see and hear these birds. And then we saw one of the two species of oxpeckers that are in uh, Botswana. We saw the yellow-billed ox. You can see this yellow-billed oxpecker hanging out on this southern giraffe. And what they do is they pick ticks off the giraffes. Uh, and they're cavity nesters, so they're typically found in woodlands with animals associated with woodlands like giraffes. This is a southern mass weaver. Mass weavers are known for their elaborate nests. The entrance to the nest is near the bottom. And the male builds a nest for the female. And if she does not like the nest, he will tear it down and start over. And so he will work quite uh, diligently to, uh, to please that female. And this slide tells me that uh, this is my last slide. And that is all I have to show you tonight. And so I would like to thank you for coming, and I think there is a little bit of time to answer some questions.